All right, so here is Bostrom's simulation argument, and I've, I've simplified it. Two premises and a conclusion. So just structurally here that, you know, we're saying uh, if one and two, then or thus or therefore uh, three. So you notice the conclusion that the argument is taking us to is that you are likely, not definitely, but likely in a virtual universe, a virtual world. Um, for Bostrom, that means specifically uh, a computer simulated world. Uh, we'll, we'll maybe talk a bit of, uh, later about how um, you know argu uh, Bostrom's argument can be generalized uh, beyond uh, computer simulations. But uh, but uh, for now, let's let's look at premise one and two. Uh, premise one this is sort of a starting assumption that you can't determine uh, from within your world whether your universe is physical or virtual. So this is uh, almost a definition of the term virtual. Virtual means uh, virtually indistinguishable from, from reality. So by that definition, an inhabitant of a, of a, of a world can't tell whether their world is real or simulated, right? So that applies to us. We, uh, as inhabitants of our world, can't determine from within it whether it's a real world or a, a virtual world. Okay, premise two is that each physical universe or uh, base reality or a original reality, non-simulated reality, can host, uh, support, give rise to many many, many, many virtual universes. It's really just a question of, you know, uh, let's say dividing hard drives and uh, copy pasting the program. I mean, n notice how on, on your very own computer, you can run many iterations of a, well, let's not call them virtual worlds because we're not there yet in, the, in the, you know, the simulation technology, but uh, take your favorite game and you can uh, partition your hard drive or just in some way run many, many, many iterations on your own computer of that of that program. I, you know, there, there are a few reasons that would feed into premise two to support it. But I think one of, one of the key um, supporting ideas here is that programming is difficult, but storage space is cheap um, so that uh, it, it's difficult, you know, it's, it's a major feat of a technological civilization to design and implement, uh, you know, the hard drive and, and the software to run a simulation. Uh, but once, once you've done that engineering work, it's very easy to copy paste the program and to create more, more space to run it on. So, I mean, we, we see that apply, uh, just in today's production and dissemination and, um, you know, um, running of, of quasi virtual worlds. I won't, I won't call them vir our, our, even our best, you know, video games do not pass the test proposed by premise one. They don't fool anybody into thinking their reality as immersive as some of these, some of these, uh, video games can be. But, um, you know, when EA Sports releases FIFA 2020, um, you know, it takes them maybe months or years, many, many thousands of uh, uh, worker hours to program it. But once it's out there, you know, it sells, let's say, a million copies globally. You have a million... <laughs> iterations of that virtual soccer world now running in our real universe right and that's just that's just one game i mean right now in on planet earth forget about the whole universe on planet earth alone we have you know millions upon millions of simulations running or being hosted by our base level reality and if you think a little bit more generally beyond beyond a computer simulation in particular, notice that on the surface of planet Earth right now, we have billions of sort of virtual universes running just by the fact that mammals tend to dream. 
so uh, right now, half let's say half the mammals in the world are asleep, and I'm not sure if all mammals dream, but let's say half half the mammals right now uh, on, on Earth are dreaming. It, those dreams are a kind of virtual world too. They're not computer simulated, though. If we start to think about the the brain itself as a kind of computational architecture, then then um, maybe the dreaming isn't that different in principle from um, <clears throat> a programmed uh, computer-based virtual reality. And, and notice with dreaming, actually dreams, unlike FIFA 2020 or probably even FIFA 2025 when it comes out, dreams pass that uh, criterion proposed by premise one. So um, typically in our dreams, we can't tell while we're in them whether they're dreams or not. When when we wake up, when we're outside of the dream, then we realize, ah, it was just a dream. But almost, almost, it's almost definitional of typical dream that that it fools you. Um, so, dreaming <laughs> is is more advanced than than um, computer simulation uh, for now. So, uh, th back to premise two. This just shows that. At least in our experience, right? Um, one original physical reality ends up hosting uh, many, many, many virtual worlds within it. So that ratio is one real world to millions, billions, if we include dreaming, <sighs> even right now. Um, so Bostrom now would want you to think about these two premises together. So if you think, if you if you accept one and then you accept two, you should be taken to the conclusion that we're likely, we, you, whoever's thinking the argument, is likely in a virtual universe, right? right. Because <clears throat> you can't tell within it whether it's real or virtual, so you have to uh, refer to something more objective. And premise two gives us that objective um, perspective. It gives us the expected ratio of real to virtual universes. And so you, you can't tell within the universe whether it's real or not, but you do know that there are way, way more virtual universes than real ones. So just the mathematical likelihood is three. You're likely in a virtual universe. Right. So that's, I mean, that, that to me is the, the heart of the simulation argument. And, um, yeah. Um, before we move on, I just want to emphasize how different this argument is, how, how new this argument is, as far as I know. Um, how different it is from, you know, for example, Plato's cave or Descartes' um, demon. Um, Descartes in, oh, somewhere around 1650, famously uh, proposed that, that he, he had no way of determining whether he was dreaming or awake. He had no way of determining whether his mind was under the control of a super powerful demon or genius who was distorting his um, beliefs, distorting his uh, picture of reality. Descartes' point was that you can't be certain that you're awake. You can't be certain that you're free of this uh, interfering demon. But Descartes did not try to argue that you're likely dreaming, that you're likely under the control of an evil genius, right? Um, Bostrom's argument is that you're likely in a virtual universe. You're likely, uh, you know, electronically dreaming. Um, so that's it's an astonishing conclusion. I mean, uh, unless you can find a way to <laughs> stop the inference, either finding some 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 you know fatal flaw or not, maybe not fatal flaw, but you know um, 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 
significant flaw with one of the premises or noticing something wrong in the inference in, in the in the thus in the move from the premises to the conclusion unless you can do that you're sort of stuck logically with this conclusion like it or not that you're likely in a virtual universe <clears throat> okay bostrom says you should accept that conclusion unless you take one of the following two points to be likely that first civilizations tend to go extinct before becoming vr capable or vr able civilizations are unlikely to run vrs for various reasons we can talk about briefly i'm not going to spend very much time on the second point um, because i think it's uh, it's implausible uh, but the first point i think is worth dwelling on so the point here is is a little tricky i think it's <sighs> The question is not whether we homo sapiens will tend to uh, uh, go extinct or will go extinct. The question is whether as a sort of general rule of technological progress, that technological civilizations tend to go extinct before becoming virtual reality capable. The, 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 the uh, point is, if, if it's true that this is kind of a rule, let's say it's an absolute rule, and, uh, which would be unfortunate for us because we're, we're on the cusp of becoming VR capable. I mean, we're, we're maybe within decades of that. And um, this rule, if, if true, uh, actually, if, if, if we took out the 10 to and put in uh, definitely go extinct before becoming VR capable, that means our time is just about up. But if, if, if that's true, that would imply that the, the ratio of real worlds to virtual worlds is actually uh, one to zero. There's one real world and never a virtual world because of this, this rule of extinction. So it's, it's, Bostrom is correct that if, if this rule is, is true, then it's much, much less likely, at least, uh, that we're in some kind of virtual world. Now, why would you think that this, this rule about technological progress is true? Well, <clears throat> consider the Fermi paradox. So the Fermi paradox is the juxtaposition of two facts or apparent facts. The first fact is that space is silent. That is the universe hasn't talked back to us yet. At least we haven't received uh, you know, radio signals um, from another technological civilization uh, beyond Earth. So that's fact one, that space is so far silent. We've been, we've been tuning our, you know, satellite dishes to the heavens for a few decades now. I think the SETI project, uh, the American-based search for extraterrestrial intelligence began in the i think 1970s uh, is was, was maybe one of its heydays but anyway so far space is silent and the, the second fact is the universe is huge and uh, here we have a sort of snapshot of i think a good chunk of the universe i believe many of these blobs of light would represent whole galaxies um, and, you know, the typical galaxy contains tens of billions of star systems, like our sun system. And the universe itself, the observable universe, uh, has tens of billions of um, galaxies. So, it's, I mean, it's, it's a practical infinity, let's say, of star systems out there. And we don't need to speculate. We now, we now know that many of these star systems have planets orbiting them. Uh, just not, not too long ago, we had to sort of guess at that, but we're, we are, we've recently developed techniques to really detect the orbiting planets around some of the nearer star systems. And it turns out a lot of them do have uh, planets around them. So even if we have the narrow assumption that life requires a planetary cradle to evolve on uh, there are a lot of cradles out there i mean you know uh, and so the fact that space is silent juxtaposed with the fact that there 
are so many opportunities for life to develop out there creates what's called the, this is the fermi paradox it's 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 it seems that those both shouldn't be true right um, that space should be noisy with technological life because there's so many opportunities for life to evolve and the universe is very old also right we uh, life on earth is four billion years old maybe we were a little bit late in the life game maybe we were a little bit early in the life game by the cosmic standard um, and you can see how once a species kind of gets technological really in the blink of an eye by cosmic time um, it, can, it can come at least to the, to the cusp of virtual reality technology um, so um, it's odd that we seem to be the only technological civilization out there now there are many many proposed solutions to this paradox you can you can check out the wikipedia article uh, which has a long a long list and overview of many of the proposed solutions over the last few decades since since the paradox was originally proposed i think back in the maybe 1950s or 60s but but one um, proposed answer is relevant to our problem here today so it would be true that civilizations tend to go extinct before becoming vr capable if if um it was sort of a, a fact that vr able civilizations tend to destroy themselves and one answer to the fermi paradox is that that's exactly what's going on space is silent because the the very civilizations who'd be capable of broadcasting radio signals uh, you know across the depths of, of space and time tend to go offline very soon after they've they've developed that capacity right i mean no, notice in our own case and we got to be careful about um inferring general trends from our own single case i mean we have only one example of you know globally speaking a technological civilization or a technological species uh, so again we need to be careful about inferring general rules here but notice uh, somewhat eerily that in the very same century we developed the technology to broadcast interstellar radio signals this is the 20th century is the century in which we began developing computer technology and virtualizing technology and is the very same century in which uh, we developed truly apocalyptic technologies so this is one of the great uh, you know macabre memes of the 20th century the the atomic or the nuclear mushroom cloud this is the picture of i think this was the largest uh, uh, nuclear detonation ever back in 1960 this was a russian siberian nuke test called the czar bomba and that is <laughs> I'll just point out that cloud you see is emerging from above the cloud line. This is the this is the cloud cover, and this is the atomic blast emerging above that. It was I don't know. You can look it up, but I think it was 25, 30, 40 kilometers high. Okay, so we we've clearly uh, this little monkey species on Earth has clearly in the 20th century developed the um, a tragic capacity to destroy itself and life on on, on earth so uh you know we're now playing sort of russian roulette with life on earth this is just one technology assumedly in the coming decades we're going to develop more of these apocalyptic technologies and i sometimes think it's 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 amazing we've avoided destroying ourselves so far i mean given human propensity for violence and war making it's it seems it sometimes seems a miracle we haven't had an all-out nuclear war yet um actually a bit of a footnote but you could develop a second kind of simulation argument i guess or well maybe not a simulation argument but i let's put it this way if if, if five centuries uh continued and we still had not had a an all-out nuclear war that is if hiroshima and nagasaki were the last 
you know, uh, atomic weapons used in war, even by the 25th century. And we haven't had some major change in human consciousness that uh, makes us, you know, globally Gandhian. In a funny way, that would be kind of evidence that our world is under control of, if not a benign simulator, then something godlike. That is the fact we've avoided war for so long implies that something powerful is intervening in world history to prevent us from from taking the simulation offline through internal violence. Anyway, that's, as I said, a footnote. But um, Look, if, if we are able, civilizations tragically tend to destroy themselves just as they're developing the kinds of technologies that would allow them to create worlds, right? I mean, here's the deep rule, perhaps, that uh, the very same, you, you might expect the very same technologies that or, or the very same discoveries into, into reality that allow you to create worlds, to virtualize worlds, give you a, a, a insight into how to destroy worlds too. And then, and then you get this rule. So this is certainly a debatable rule, but if, if you find these sorts of reflections plausible, then you've got some reason to think that perhaps this rule is correct, right? So, um, and notice again, if this is correct, then it's not likely we're in a simulation. I mean, we might be, but the, the expected ratio of real worlds to virtual worlds is no longer one to millions. It's if this rule is absolute, it's one to zero, or it's one to a much smaller number. And then we can continue with our life safe in the thought that we are in the original world, not the virtual world. Now, I said I wouldn't spend very much time on this. Second worry of Bostrom's VR able civilizations are unlikely to run VR. So the, the idea here is uh, the, the civilization could acquire the VR capability, but uh, for, for, one of a number of reasons or several reasons um, really pass a law against running virtual realities. So imagine that we become VR capable in the year 2100. Uh, but let's say uh, we find, uh, you know, extreme ethical objections to the creation of virtual worlds. I mean, virtual worlds would be ones which, which have virtual inhabitants who believe they're in a real world and who uh, live and suffer. And uh, we might just uh, take this to be so ethically objectionable. We pass, you know, the UN passes some absolute um, law against uh, running virtual realities. <clears throat> Uh, so that could be one reason. Uh, I just, it just it strikes me as so implausible that even if we did pass such a law, that the law would be abided by, absolutely. And notice it just takes one, you know, supervillain, uh, I mean, let's say, um, uh, who has uh, a big hard drive and uh, computational resources, and under the radar of the UN uh, runs many, many iterations of a virtual world. Maybe this is a supervillain, super biologist, and wants to run... Uh, life simulations wants to run many, many iterations of an evolving life world to test certain hypotheses about evolution or to develop some virtual super species or uh, whatever, whatever the, the, the scientific goal of, of these simulations is. Uh, a good, a good super scientist, a good super villain in this case will want to run many, many iterations of that virtual world, not just one, right? To, to, learn more. Uh, and again, if programming is hard, but, uh, um, you know, uh, storage space is cheap, then that one supervillain could, once they've properly programmed a virtual reality, could easily run many iterations of it. So notice the interesting fact that even if there's just one person running, running virtual realities in, in this civilization, which has banned virtual reality, we could get the ratio that the, virtu the simulation argument begins with. You could still make it, make it the case that there's one reality and many, many simulations within that reality. So uh, 
you know, for considerations like this, I, I just find this so unlikely. Um, and I don't worry about it. I would really focus on whether this is plausible. Okay. All right. Worlds within worlds. This is uh, to generalize a little bit from the um, computational concerns of Bostrom. The, the argument is about the possibility of worlds within worlds, um, host worlds, <clears throat> hosting um, smaller worlds. And the kinds of worlds we're interested in, especially today, are the worlds which are like this world. This is called Democracy. This was a, at the New York World's Fair in 1939, a little mock-up of the American city of the future. And you can see here the, the denizens of real New York, 1939, um, observing, um, probably for the photo op with candid interest. I think it was a revolving platform of the city of the future. But we've got this partition, and this is a nice visual symbol of what's key for our discussion today, that the virtual world, let's call this the virtual world, or the world within the world, the world within the physical reality, um, it's partitioned from the real world. Um, think of this glass as a one-way mirror, that the, the, the real New Yorkers can look in on the world they've created, uh, but the, the denizens of this world, so to speak, um, you know, there aren't really, aren't really, little smurfs running around in there but imagine there are um, they are not aware that they're being they're being watched and and you know the question of the, the, the deep epistemological question of, of Bostrom's argument is how do you know that you're not in this kind of situation that you're in a reality which feels sort of self-contained to you but in fact is being observed and uh, funded by a broader deeper, more powerful uh, host world. Okay. And computer simulation is one way that could happen. So one way uh, sort of this, this architecture could be realized is through, through computer simulation so that this world is the, is the um, civilization that develops computer technology and this is sort of the program being run. But there are, there are other ways of thinking about this world within world relationship. Here's Shakespeare. This is the prologue to Henry V. It's an interesting, interesting moment in the, in the sort of Shakespearean canon. Um, it's one of the few moments where the actor is talking directly to the audience. So this is, this is a little speech that the, they're called the chorus. They come on stage and sort of before the action of this, this war, war between France and England, begins, uh, the chorus speaks directly to the audience. And there are a few other moments in Shakespeare where this happens, where there's a prologue or a chorus. Um, but um, This speech was perhaps given at the opening of the Globe Theater um, in around 1600. Uh, you can check me on that. But, uh, <clears throat> and you can, you can see that it's, it's a speech uh, about theater. It's an invocation, in fact, uh, for the theater itself. And it begins, Oh, for a muse of fire that would ascend the brightest heaven of invention. This is a wish for what seems to be a sun, the muse of fire, the inspiring fire source that would ascend the brightest heaven of invention. Heaven here means the sky, I think. Invention means of fantasy or imagination. So, and the O, and the O is a wish. The, the speaker here, the chorus, is wishing out loud for a, an inspirational source for the theater that would be as real and as powerful as what we call the sun. It's a little bit weird. I mean, I think one of the questions we want to ask the, um, the chorus is, are you aware there actually is a sun outside of your theater? I wonder if this chorus who's speaking, this is a sort of phantom of the opera type character who is so immersed in theatrical reality that they have a faded sense of what's out there beyond the theater. That's why they're sort of wishing for a sun without realizing that it exists. But continuing, they say, uh, oh, for a sun, 
and a kingdom for a stage, princes to act and monarchs to behold the swelling scene. So this is a, a, a wish that we could have reality rather than theater, that, or theater that's as, as encompassing as reality, a kingdom for a stage instead of this measly little stage, um, um, a whole kingdom to act upon and princes to act instead of um, probably underpaid, um, um, not very respected, um, actors <clears throat> speaking their lines from the little wooden platform. We could have a real princes running about a stage as large as a kingdom and monarchs to behold the swelling scene. Um, then should the warlike Harry, this is where it gets a little bit weird. It almost uh, starts to eat itself. Then should the warlike Harry like himself Harry is Henry. This is a play about uh, Henry V, of course, and Harry was his um, sort of youthful nickname. The warlike Harry means the, the, the Harry who tends to uh, wage war. He's about to wage war on France. That's the main action of this play, Henry V. Then should the warlike Harry, like himself, assume the port of Mars. The port here means the comportment or the style of or the walk of and the dress of uh, and mars is the roman god of war so um if if uh we have this situation where the whole the actual kingdom is now the stage and the princes are the actors then it's a weird thought but then um we have to ask who are they imitating, right? So commoners, when they put on a, a crown and um, doublets and um, speak high English are pretending to be, or they're imitating actual princes and monarchs. But if we have the, if we, if we have the situation now where the, the, the monarchs are themselves the actors, right? Where the theater is more encompassing, we then have to ask in the spirit of theater, well, who are they playing? Who, who are these princes imitating or playing? And Shakespeare's answer is Mars, right? The gods. So commoners through the actual Elizabethan theater imitate princes. I mean, I think maybe half or more than half of Shakespeare's plays were about monarchs. But in this more enlarged theater, the monarchs themselves are going to be imitating gods. So there's this there's this very interesting kind of vision of reality implied here, where you've got these nested circles, these sort of concentric circles of imitative reality, um, where uh, you know the, the the theater as we know it is imitating our reality, our wider you know um, global reality. But perhaps our global, what we call the global reality, the, 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 the world size stage of uh, real kings and kingdoms is itself imitating uh, the realm we call the divine realm. So there's, there's a sort of theatrical interpretation here of religious metaphysics that the gods are the reality, which uh, the higher reality, which we imitate here on earth right when when harry is in in war making mode when he's waging war on france he's in that aspect imitating in particular the god of war right that the war making monarch is in imitation of the god of of war so this is not an argument. This is, I mean, we haven't been given anything like premises in favor of the conclusion that we are likely uh, the, a, a large world-sized theater that is imitating a larger world or a host world uh, of, of divines. But, uh, um, <laughs> you know, uh, what it lacks in premises, it makes up for maybe partly in uh, rhetorical power. Um, Shakespeare here is... Uh, using some of his most powerful language to to speak directly to the audience about about this sort of let's call it a theatrical ontology.
All right. A little bit later in the speech, um, um, there's this wonderful call out to the audience, the the chorus, who, again, I'm taking to be sort of the spirit of theater itself, the sort of phantom of the opera, is now enjoining the audience to assist in the production of this virtual world called theater. Uh, the the speech is partly an apology for the for the um, limits of Eliz Elizabethan theater. Uh, this was a theater which operated largely without, I think, scenery or even very much in the way of props. I mean, you might have you might hand Henry a little wooden sword to wave about as he speaks his lines. But Elizabethan theater, I, I believe, was largely speechifying. It was the actors on stage, uh, you, you know, moving about and and gesturing and speaking their lines. And so it's very far graphically um, from an immersive virtual reality. But there's a desire to create a, a virtual reality through theater and, and the spirit of the theater is asking the audience to help out. So in a, in a way that here the um, chorus is, is asking the audience to sort of serve as the graphical processor of the theater. The, the spirit says, think when we talk of horses, that you see them printing their proud hoofs in the receiving earth. So we're going to say horses. <laughs> it's, it's you know, uh, quasi-medieval warfare, and um, there's going to be horses running at each other with uh, men waving swords. But, we're, you know, not a single actual horse will come on stage here, or even a mock-up of a horse. We're just going to say the word horses. Uh, in our speech, and you shall, in your mind's eye, you're the graphical processor, you must see them with this, this wonderful image of, you know, 48 frames per second, super HD graphical processing, printing their proud hoofs. So we're just going to say horse, and you're going to see the horse in slow motion down to its, you know, micro movements, and you're going to see the hoof pounding the earth which softens to receive it. And you can imagine the dust puffs <laughs> emerging from that point of impact and again, slow motion. So there's the, the, the uh, speech is priming the audience, priming its gra graphical process or tuning it to a very fine level before, before the actual play begins. Uh, so th clearly uh, this is not Shakespeare's only speech where he compares life to theater. I think it's rhetorically his most powerful version of it. But um, uh, I, you know, I, we can only speculate about what Shakespeare the man thought, but I like the idea that Shakespeare himself, his religion was the theater, and he believed that in fact, in fact, uh, life was a kind of theater, imitating something higher. And that theater had this then sort of church-like function of ritualistically um, reminding us of, of this deep truth about, about reality. And finishing off, we've seen uh, uh, through Bostrom uh, a computer simulated uh, reality. We've seen through Shakespeare a theatrically induced uh, reality. And here in this wonderful piece of literature by the Argentinian writer Borges, is imagined the production of an entire planetary reality through a uh, very precise encyclopedic description of it. So I won't, I won't um, run through the sort of plot of, of this story, but the, the idea at the heart of it is that a precisely worked out encyclopedic description of an imagined planet planet in this case is named Tlone, would be indistinguishable from an actual planet called Tlone? Or would um, create that planet? That, that if you precisely describe something, that thing becomes real. That that's almost the principle of magic that by speaking the thing with enough precision 
the thing is is manifest and and the speaking or the spell in in the way Borges imagines it is a uh, conspiracy of European geniuses who over a period of several centuries composed this multi-volume encyclopedia describing an imaginary planetary civilization called Tlon. But they work it out in such detail over dozens of volumes that um, by the end of the story, the author reports that Earth is turning into, into Tlon. So uh, remember, the core of Bostrom's argument is uh, that a ho host world is likely to contain many um, sub-worlds or virtual worlds. And so you're likely in a virtual one because you can't tell from within which one you're in. So you've just got to rely on the ratio. Now, <clears throat> computation is just one way that ratio could be realized. It can be realized through computation. It can be realized through animal dreaming. It can be realized through something like theatrical manifestation or other ways. And that just it increases the, the ratio. It becomes from one to many, if you're just thinking about the computational um, input to one to many, many. And final, final note, I am sure that many of you have been thinking about the religious implications of Bostrom's argument. Um, if, if we are in a simulation, then the simulator would be our God. The, the simulator would be the creator of our world. If, if the simulation is somewhat of an imitation of its host world, then we would be made in the image of that God. The God would, relative to our world, be omnipotent. That is, that the God would have total control over our world, could uh, break the laws of nature through hacking or uh, recoding. So it's just, it's interesting, of course, to note that we've, we speak of God in metaphorical terms, and those metaphors change with the changing of the technology. So a few centuries ago, in the, in the age of Newtonian mechanism, a dominant metaphor for God was God as a great, you know, clockmaker or mechanical engineer. And I mean, go go back a couple millennia, and you get God as the shepherd of the flock in a, in you know in a, in a herding civilization. And we now, in the age of computer programming, have uh, have this wonderful metaphor of God as a kind of programmer. And uh, you know, the very opening of the Gospel of John, which gives gives John's sort of retelling of Genesis. I mean, this is John. Um, several centuries after the composition of the original in the beginning. In the beginning, um, God created heaven and the earth. Here's John a few centuries later, um, maybe updating that version. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Um, in fact, if we're, if we're using the programmer metaphor here, John is telling us God isn't just the programmer. God is the program itself, or God is the code that runs the universe. Um, and there's a nice linguistic continuity here where this word logos this sort of master concept from western intellectual history this is the greek word for word and john who who wrote in greek used the word logos his word was logos and we've translated that into english as a capital w word as a very special kind of word and the logos is the this this root word is the same logos that you find in all of our ologies, our um, psychologies and biologies. And um, it's also the logos uh, at the heart of the word logic. And so there's 
least there's a nice lingu linguistic continuity from John's mystical logos, which is which is equivalent with God, and the logic, <laughs> the logical machine, which is the, the the computer that Turing and and others sort of mapped out. Let's see, the current date is. 1980, we have here a screenshot of one of the early interfaces of the personal computer. And personal computer means um, sized to the domestic and usable by uh, the layperson, and not a room sized uh, energy sink. In, you know, a basement lab at MIT. But uh, the interface is, is rather impersonal. That is, the interface is actually right here at, at the command prompt. This is where you, the human user, communicate with the computer, interface with it. And you, you don't have to learn programming language to, to load an executable file like this one. But you do need to learn a bit of computer ease to to you know to run an early personal computer you there's an interface is always a median point between between the user and 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 the machine and you know there are interfaces that actually demand the user come come down pretty close to the machine's form of uh, I don't want to say thinking yet but uh, <clears> that <throat> the person act like a machine, and then there are interfaces which which uh, make the machine indistinguishable from a person. And um, so today we're going to talk about the personalizing of the computer in this more radical sense, which was part of Steve Jobs' vision for the personalizing of the computer to to give it a personality and a voice and make it a member of the household. Uh, just as R2-D2, the decade prior, had made robots uh, like, like anthropomorphic pets. Here's an early computer game. And you can see the interface is very much like the uh, DOS interface. You have a command prompt where you enter your actions. This is where you act as the hero of this adventure. The name of the game is capital A Adventure. And you enter instructions like take food. And if I remember from my adolescence and childhood encounter with these, these, these sorts of games, part of the uh, quote unquote fun, or at least challenge of these games, was knowing exactly how to uh, describe the action you wanted to take. The, the, uh, there might be a very narrow syntax and semantics that the computer understands and uh, take food might work and uh, um, eat, eat the food might not work. I, I can't remember for this particular game, but, but uh, you have to again come as the human user come close to the computer and speak its very narrow range of uh, quasi-English to get it to interact with you. So this is uh, a bit of a step up graphically. I'm, you can probably recognize that this is all ASCII-based graphics, that this this dungeon world, and this is, if you've played a game like a D Diablo, typical hack and slash dungeon crawl, you've you've played a rogue-based game, basically. This is Rogue from the early 80s. It's, it's a really great game. It's a, I spent many, many hours um, roaming through the dungeons of, I think the dungeons of doom. And uh, here's, here's you, the adventurer, you're the happy face, and you're currently interacting with, probably fighting, a B for bat. Each letter of the alphabet represented a monster you might find among these dungeons. And after you take care of the bat, you might pick up a magical scroll or Q for quaff a potion. And this is a top-down view of level six, six levels down in this, I think, infinite dungeon. But uh, this is graphically 
a step up. This is now an environment which has been incarnated. The, the world of adventure, the previous game, was all graphically processed in your mind. The interface presented you with abstractions of that world. Here the, here the game world, the virtual world, is now incarnating, meaning it's taking on a form which resembles the physical world. We have uh, an agent moving through space. And um, <clears throat> it's uh, turn-based, so not quite real time, but um, there is action here in a spatial environment. William Gibson, who gave us our term cyberspace, describes it here in, in, in a classic sci-fi work about a sort of cyber surfer. Put the trodes on, which lets you input into the virtual world. And they were out there, all the data in the world, stacked up like one big neon city so that you could cruise around and have a kind of grip on it, visually anyway. Because if you didn't, it was too complicated trying to find your way to a particular piece of data you needed. Um, of course, when you turn Neuromancer into a movie, it also gives the viewer of the film um, a, a graphical uh, handle on the action of the film. But Gibson here is implying that there, there's a good reason to organize data in a kind of quasi-physical environment, like one big neon city, I imagine here, uh, almost like a <clears throat> city-sized library, and the stacks represent the stacks of data. And you access the data not as in DOS by entering into the A command prompt uh, list directory, or DIR, and then um, you know scrolling through the directory to find the item you want. We have the data arranged in a environment that your avatar or your virtual incarnation moves through in a way retaining and replicating uh, our ancestral environment which is not just the african savanna but we can maybe as we increasingly virtualize we'll think of physical reality as the ancestral environment and there may be reasons to retain in the virtual environment many of the features of the ancestral environment. This is, I think, this is all contained here in Gibson's idea, the idea that you get a kind of kind of grip on the data if it's arranged physically. That you can. Uh, Davis talks about the user being able to um, use many of the easy bequeathments of our evolutionary history. You have a rich perceptual cognitive system which has been really uh, designed to make sense of physical environments and to decode these sorts of environments. And so when we uh, are, are seeking data, uh, it might make sense to arrange it in a way that's familiar to us. In other words, we've been talking about the interface being some median point between between the user and the machine and of course the user would like just for their own sake just for the, their own ease of use they would like the that point to be very close to them they'd like the computer to speak colloquial english and to not have to input it by this 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 keyboard um but there's also a, a sound um you know data science reason to uh to make the interface uh, user-friendly. Davis spends quite a, quite a chunk of the chapter on this, this particular ancient mnemonic technique called the, the memory palace. The Ars Memoria are the ancient memory techniques. And the memory palace is maybe the, the most dramatic of them. And it's counterintuitive because it, the memory palace would have you learn a big a, a big data set by associating each item in the set 
with a place in a imagined palace or some kind of environment. I think Davis uses the, uses the example of a shopping mall. You uh, <clears throat> imagine in your mind a consistent environment that you can virtually, in your mind's uh, theater, navigate through. Uh, that is, again, consistently so that each time you come back to it, uh, the, the interior locations are all the same. And then you, let's say the list you need to memorize is the table of elements with all the associated uh, chemical weights, chemical masses. Um, you, uh, you would assign each item in the table of elements, each, each chemical to a different place, say in the shopping mall. So uh, maybe uh, carbon you associate with, with diamond, and so you assign carbon to the people's jewelry shop in your, in your hometown shopping mall. And to remember, to recall the table of elements when you're sitting down to write your, your uh, uh, ke chemistry exam, you resituate yourself in, 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 your, mental, in your mental environment in this, in this little walkthrough. And as you pass people's jewelry in your mind, you should remember carbon. This is counterintuitive because remember, you're, you've set out the, to, to memorize the table of elements. And the memory palace technique would have you memorize a second thing, the shopping mall, and also memorize all the links between um, the table of elements and the shopping mall. So it seems on the face of it, you're doubling your work, but th there are many testaments, some of which Davis uh, uh, recounts to the the efficacy of this technique. It's, it's, it's still used uh, quite a bit among people in the modern day who need to memorize a lot. And perhaps it works because it takes advantage of these ancestral bequeathments. Um, we, our, our memory is trained to be keyed to an environment of interest that we're navigating with our bodies. And we'll have a much better time memorizing something if it's linked to the environment in this way. Um, so the Ars Memoria is a, is a technique from well before the age of, of virtual worlds, of computerized virtual worlds, which indicates that if, if we think of the internet as a way of organizing data, as a big data dump initially, which we want to then organize to keep it accessible and useful, um, it might be that the virtualizing of the internet is is a sound. It's not just fun. It's not just a cool way of showing it in our science fiction movies. It's um, um, a highly functional way of organizing that data. Interesting sort of footnote of a thought. <clears throat> just as uh, you know, as we start to create virtual worlds, a Nick Bostrom comes along and says, well, w wait a second. Um, what if we are ourselves in something like that? When we think now about the purpose of a memory palace, which is a, is a imagined virtual world as organizing data, you can at least start to think about asking what, what is the world? What is this? reality we're in, one, one possible answer, an interesting answer, is it's an archive. It's a, it's a way to store and access info, and that begs the question, for whom? <laughs> and I guess the, the short, quick answer would be for God. And we are in multiple God's complex avatars who are moving through the environment and accessing data, n n not usually cognizant of the ultimate reason we're accessing that data, but, um, but uh, we're these little we're these uh, library protocols moving through God's great mentally sustained memory palace and by which God remembers useful information. I guess this then begs the question of what the information is for and what is it God needs to, to remember. But uh, anyway, the Ars Memoria. 
we can expect user interfaces. This is an excerpt from the, the Davis chapter. We can expect user interfaces, including internet browsers, websites, and program control panels to plunge us ever deeper into such iconic simulations and to pull us further from the binary code to the space where the action really lies into three-dimensional worlds animated with demonic agents and interdimensional portals that conceal an underlying layer of purely logical protocols. So as computer culture advances, as the technology advances, it starts to look less like um, technology and starts to resemble something more like a world. This reminds me a bit of Clark's third law, which may come up a couple times in this course, Clark's third you know what i'm not going to try to write that with my mouse arthur c clark c l a r k e um proposed a t tongue a little bit in cheek i think uh, a third law of i think it was technologic civilization i'm not sure what the other two are the third one i think is the most famous by far clark's third law is that uh, technology becomes more like magic as it matures so the first mobile phones are um, the size of the head they're held up next to in 1982 and uh, you know perhaps in 20 years they'll look back on us who hold up much smaller um, devices to our heads still they'll laugh and say remember when we used to have objects called phones i mean in 20 years the telecommunication may be seamless with the mind body maybe a fully integrated partially wetware technology and uh, the user who wants to talk to you know phone their mother will just start talking to their mother and the, and the internal cell phone will understand their intention to call mother and just uh, you know, Clark's third law is that a sufficiently advanced technology will will look like insanity too. People will seem to be walking around talking to themselves, but they'll actually be telecommunicating. Anyway, there's a similar idea here, which is that as virtual worlds, um, well, not virtual worlds, but as as our computers, let's just say our computers become more advanced. Uh, they become more like worlds we can enter and navigate and not just because it's fun to play games like this so this is approaching the state of the art well beyond um, rogue and adventure and there's this almost there's this um very appealing trajectory from the text-based game to this fully immersive world and again that's fun for the user, but it's also maybe the best way, the most efficient way, weirdly, of encoding data. Davis talks about these two major trends in, in um, computer technology, and we can associate Steve Jobs with this mission of personalizing the computer. And then Mark Pesky, I hope I pronounced that right, um, he associates with the the vision going back to the 1990s to perceptualize the internet to take the internet from uh, you know a complicated list and give it a, a graphical overlay and uh so pesky develops this early uh, i think it's a what is it a graphical protocol or a graphical overlay for for the internet and uh, this mission to perceptualize the internet and personalize the computer again, may be driven by very sound, functional um, goals. Let's talk a little bit more about personalizing the computer now. The idea here is to make the computer not just person-sized. But to make the computer more like a person, something we can interact with again using um this this wonderful uh millions old millions of years old repertoire of interpersonal communication we have with our computer um, tools of course ethically as they become more person-like we'll have to question whether the word tool is appropriate for them uh if you check out uh, the Loebner Prize, 
this is a prize uh, it's a contest held held annually anyway uh, for the best of field chatbot of that year and uh it's a kind of uh, turing test contest and mitsuku which you can whom you can converse with online if you wish um, is one of the multiple year winners you might you might not be that impressed by her i mean if you set if you if you set yourself the goal of frying her brain wires you can pretty quickly do that uh, by just uh talking to Mitsuku, maybe the way you'd, you'd text chat to a friend uh, by diving into neologisms and colloquialisms. Um, she'll very quickly revert to a very rigid, <laughs> uh, try to, tr she'll try to keep you in line in a very sort of rigid form of communication. Uh, so I think, I think if Mitsuku is the best of field, she's very far from passing any kind of Turing test that I would adjudicate. So here's the classic Turing test, here's the judge, and here are the contestants. One is a computer chatbot and one is a human um, interlocutor. And the judge has to decide after five minutes or five hours, there are, there are many variations on the test, uh, which one was the computer. And the computer's trying to pretend to be a person and the, I guess the person's being a person. And um, Turing's idea was that once a computer can consistently fail, I guess, good judges of the Turing test, we should start treating that computer like it's um, intelligent and um, maybe maybe even conscious. I'm not sure if Turing went to that point, but if you want to see, uh, I, I found this a lot more impressive than Mitsuku. If you Google GP2, GPT2, sorry, um, a, a project by a California-based um, research group, OpenAI. They've developed, it's a, it's a simple in its, in its, in its um, function, text predictor. It just, you input any text to it and it predicts what the subsequent text would be. Um, and this, this could turn it into a chatbot if you if you input hi how are you it from its experience with human communication predicts that the next line in that in that on that page would be character prompt uh, not bad how are you <clears throat> it, it works really well with some text uh, a little bit more variable with other text but um, it can compose some pretty interesting poetry if you feed it you know, 30 lines of Allen Gin Ginsberg's Howell, it uh, it can start to rhyme off a sequence of uh, apocalyptic visions that are some of them, maybe 10% of them, as compelling as anything Ginsberg wrote. I think at this point, our, our uh, you know, we said they can't play chess and they turned out to play chess better than us. And then we said, well, they can't, they can't do something which requires a bit more fuzzy logic, like, like say, win on Jeopardy, win at a trivia game show, and the computer beat us at that, and then the poets retreated to their citadel and said, but you shall not touch poetry, this, this you shall not pass. And it turns out now that with a, again, I don't want to say simple, I'm sure the um, programming that went into this uh, was, uh, epic, but uh, the, the function is simple. You've got computers who can make some pretty interesting poetry. Um, now, I think at this point they need good human curators, but great writers have often needed great editors. So if, uh, you know, you feed um, GPT to the Western canon of poetry and then says, and I ask it, what comes next? It, it'll output some garbage, but it'll output among that garbage some very interesting poetry. And uh, you, the human curator or editor, maybe can select for GPT to uh, maybe not all that different from what uh, Aphex Twin, the British electronic artist has, has said before an interview that he just makes tons and tons of electronic music. He's got a hard drive with a practical infinity of, of tracks on it. And he just sends, sends off his, his hard drive once in a while to a close friend, a close circle of curating friends. And they, they decide what among his productions is releasable or interesting. And, um, I fixed twin is a little bit like a computer in his, in his computer based music, I guess.
quote from the Davis chapter. The skeptical question that we may find ourselves asking the AIs and software agents of the future, how do I know if you are a sentient being and not just a simulation, could similarly be addressed to voodoo's wise and mischievous entities. And the answer might very well be that it doesn't really matter. By the time you reach the point of asking, they are already loosed into your world. By the time you're compelled to perform Turing tests on our AI um, tools, it's, it's like they're already passing it. <laughs> Davis is saying here, I think. By the time we ask, are you sentient? Uh, that means they've passed some kind of threshold. They've passed into the, into the realm of the mysterious. And of course, we can ask the very same question of each other. How do I know that your color blue is the same as mine? How do I know that you see at all and aren't just a behaviorally complex zombie? Of course, that's rude and rare, but, um, but in principle, it's the same question.